explorers have the joy of investigating the animals and plants and people that, that occur in places that are far removed from where we live. For example, in the tops of trees and distant rainforests. But the problems that rainforests are facing means also that explorers have to cut through the noise in order to communicate what they learn in these far places to those members of society who may not necessarily understand the beauty and importance of them, who may not necessarily have active subscriptions to the National Geographic magazine. I believe that communication to the environmentally unaware is one of our big challenges to solve environmental problems. Big problems such as forest fragmentation, global climate change, species extinctions. How can we foster change in people who may not wish to change or not even be aware that there is a need to change? Metaphorically, I think there's one approach to do this, that we can move the focus from the immovable trunks of our big problems to those parts of this metaphorical tree that do move, that is, in this case, the leaves and twigs of a tree. And to investigate this, I turn trees into artists. What I did was attach little paintbrushes on a breezy day to the tips of trees, held up a piece of drawing paper, and allowed the tree to make art for two minutes. This was the resulting piece of art that the tree made. Being a scientist, I wanted to know how far, how much these trees could move collectively. And so I simply measured the segments of the painted tree for two minutes, added up the segments, multiplied the number of minutes by number of minutes per year, the uh, number of twigs per branch, the number of branches per tree, and came up with an accurate figure of how far collectively a single tree could move in a year. I'm sure you have a guess. <laughs> Since I only have 15 minutes, I'll tell you the answer, which is 186,540 miles per year, which is equivalent to seven times around planet Earth. So using this metaphor of a tree that seems immovable and yet is, is moving very fast and very far, I would like to share with you today um, what I think of in terms of three ways that we explorers might need to promote movement in terms of moving these environmental problems that I spoke about. Uh, one of them is moving from the unknown to the known. The second is moving information from the exclusive to the inclusive. And finally, moving from despair to hope. Um, first, from moving from the unknown to the known, one of the things that I've spent my scientific life on is exploring a very unknown place, the rainforest canopy of Monteverde, Costa Rica. Um, this is the, the rainforest canopy just 30 years ago was known as the last biotic frontier. But with a variety of mountain climbing techniques, we have been able to know the unknown very well. And I thought the best way to show this to you would be to show you a small clip of a piece of a National Geographic film called Heroes of the High Frontier, which illustrates to you how I get from the unknown to the known. So when I've gotten to the canopy, what I've learned is that um, there are a number of things that are revealed, that the biota are very diverse, and that they perform extremely important ecological roles. They enhance the water and nutrient cycles of the forest as a whole. The canopy plants provide uh, food and water for the arboreal mammals and birds that live up there for their whole lives. Uh, but there are other things that I see in the forest canopy that I've learned. One is that um, uh, we see not only ecological wholeness, but we also see human disturbances and the effects of those, of mining, of conversion from forest to agricultural use, of invasive species. In addition, what I have observed is this increasing distance of people from trees, this non-knowledge that trees are important to all of the things that we do. And so in, in response to this understanding, I started a little nonprofit called the International Canopy Network. Uh, we canopy researchers got together and began uh, publishing papers in the popular press, consulting to the media, and so forth. But very soon, I realized that I was really preaching to the choir. These products of my publicity were really getting to people who were already aware of the importance and the beauty of canopy organisms. 
So I began to ask how I can get outside that choir. How can I bring my messages to people who might not already be convinced of the importance? And I took uh, then my movement from exclusive knowledge to inclusive knowledge. And I took a clue from the fact that trees have a peculiar structure, that each twig is connected to another twig, each branch to another branch. And I realized that perhaps what I could explore is the connection of the ecological values of trees, which I just told you about, to other societal values that already exist, recreational values, aesthetic values, spiritual values, and social justice values. And I'll go through an example of each of the the projects that we've worked on in order to connect these ecological values with society. I'll start with recreational values, the toys and games that we play with. And of course, it was an easy shot to say, well, let's just make treetop Barbie after all. Um, young girls are entranced with her. What was really key here, after we approached Mattel and didn't get much of a positive response, I really don't understand why. Uh, so we began making treetop Barbies ourselves, going to Goodwills, buying used Barbies, and dressing her in these little clothes. We also made this little booklet that has information about the canopy plants of the temperate and tropical rainforest. Um, we're now working on uh, ground support Ken, but it's not as good as Stellar, so. In terms of aesthetic values, um, the power of science combined with the power of art is something that I think is very effective in terms of cutting through the noise to communicate with the environmentally unaware. And with the support of a conservation trust grant and the guidance of John Francis, uh, who awarded that, I started putting together what I call canopy confluences, where I invite and then become inclusive with scientists, artists, singers, uh, opera singers, dancers, rap singers, and forest ecologists. We spend a week in the forest together, climbing trees, making observations, and communicating what we collectively learn about the forest canopy. This has resulted in moss collections, in modern dances, in artwork, and in sculpture. But to me, perhaps the most important result was learning that I could engage rap singers to engage urban youth, at-risk urban youth, in terms of understanding the importance of trees. I hired a rap singer named Caution. We brought together 40 at-risk kids from Tacoma, Washington. We spent five days at the college campus where I taught. And in the afternoons, we adjourned to the music um, the music studios where the kids themselves then translated what they had experienced in the forest uh, with the rap singer to making their own rap songs, their own hip hop songs, and their own po spoken word poetry. Another application of aesthetics, of course, is fashion. Very powerful business in terms of people's self-image and in terms of the amount of money that people spend on clothes. I'm working now with a fashion designer in New York City to create a line of clothes called Field Guide, in which we take an image from the forest canopy. This is a piper plant, Piper Aretum. It grows in the canopy. It's in the same plant family as black pepper that you put on your scrambled eggs this morning. Uh, we make little hang tags uh, that go along with this so that the person who buys it will have that information. Information. And so when I, for instance, might go to Starbucks and I'm in line and Brooke sees me and says, Nalini, nice jacket, then I can tell her, well, this is Piper Aretum. It grows in the Monteverde Forest Clan Planting. <laughs> it's related to the black pepper, uh, and it's in an endangered ecosystem, thereby getting the message to people, again, who might cherish clothes, the applied aesthetics of clothes and fashion, whereas they might never step foot in a tropical rainforest. Spiritual values are very pervasive. About 80% of the people on this planet consider themselves religious or spiritual in nature. And my technique for doing this, for exploring the connection between the ecological values of trees with those of spiritual and religious people, was to start reading and taking notes on the religious texts of all of the world religions to find out how trees and forests are described in the holy scriptures. For example, in the Old Testament, I ended up downloading that from the, from the web, doing a search for the word tree and forests and finding that there were 328 references to the words tree and forests, uh, all of which relate to important cultural and religious values, ornamentation for temples, practical use, location descriptions, and so forth. I did the same thing with the Quran, with the Talmud, with Buddhist writings in the Bhagavad Gita. And I was able then to put together a number of sermons that I've taken to churches and temples and synagogues to provide evidence of the importance of trees, drawing not on my ecological values, but rather the words of the holy scriptures of the people in the congregation themselves. Another thing that we're doing is mapping trees in churchyards. Where we go to a churchyard, we offer to map and document all of the trees on the sacred ground of the churchyard to remind people that they are protecting not only only the nave and the holy scriptures and the pews and the pulpit, but also the fact that the trees and the biota in their own churchyards are deserving of mindfulness and of stewardship and of understanding. The last value I'll talk about is the value of social justice values. Um, 
Basically, when you think of the prisons in our country, there are 2.3 million people who are incarcerated. These people are kept away from nature as one of the consequences of their actions. Um, and that is something that I myself can hardly imagine, but I thought that they might be great candidates for needing to learn about the importance of trees and forests. My approach to this was to involve them with an ecological problem. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a great deal of harvesting of mosses and lichens for the horticulture trade, which is expanding. My research has shown that these mosses take two to three decades to regrow, and therefore it is not a sustainable practice. And so I needed to engage some people who could help me learn how to farm mosses to reduce the collection of mosses from the wild. It seemed to me also that perhaps prisoners would be the best candidates for this. They have a lot of time, they have a lot of space, they don't need sharp tools to work with mosses, and that's exactly what happened. I went to a minimum security prison just south of Olympia, Washington, where I lived, and I was able, after going through two or three prisons, found that, in fact, one of the superintendents was very sympathetic to this. I was allowed to bring my mosses together. We developed together with the inmates uh, the study design, and the, the research itself, we ended up publishing a number of scientific papers with the inmates as co-authors. This was so successful in terms of the prisoners, the, myself as a scientist, and the uh, prison administrators, that I was asked to start a science lecture series, um, and I did, and I began bringing in other scientists, sustainability experts. These lectures then began inspiring the superintendent and the inmates themselves to start putting in organic gardens vermiculture, beekeeping, water catchment. And that led then to working with conservation groups to start having the inmates raise endangered plants for restoration, the endangered organ spotted frog, and the Taylor checker spot butterfly. This program, the Sustainability in Prisons Project, has now spread to 10 state prisons in Washington state. And we are now moving towards a nationwide um, um, effort to bring this program to other states and other universities. We have a multitude of partners, agencies, NGOs, uh, and universities, as well as corrections groups. And we recently had a National Science Foundation funded conference to bring together uh, people from 10 different states to think about launching their own sustainability in prisons projects. The last piece I'd like to talk about is the movement from despair to hope. And it was in the prisons I began to feel that I was really in the pits of despair, looking at what some of the prisoners have to deal with in their own lives. We didn't have access to all of the prisons, in, all of the prisoners in these projects because some of these prisoners are kept in what is called supermax or segregated units, where because of the violence of their crimes or the nature of their crimes, they're kept away in uh, solitary confinement in small scale cells for 23 hours a day. One hour a day, they're allowed to go out to what is called recreation yards. They're very bare and very sterile. My idea was to bring nature imagery to these inmates. We couldn't bring frogs to them. We couldn't bring plants and soil to them. But we could bring the images of trees, the images of nature to them in these cells. And that's exactly what we've been able to do, starting with one prison in Oregon State, where we now have uh, projectors that are now beaming images of trees and forests and other images of nature within these very sterile cells to at least show them and expose them to the beauty of trees, which in other situations brings down stress, brings down anxiety, and brings down violence. What we found in just the first two months is that, in fact, violent interactions and, and infractions have gone down in the units where these um, nature imagery uh, um, projections are being, being offered. And so we hope to get really strong evidence for that so that we can spread that to other prisons across the country. All of us, as explorers, I think, can think about ways that we can link the values of the plants and the animals and the people that we are investigating in these far-flung places to the public, not just to the public and people like us, but to the public that may not be so aware of the importance of ecological values. And so I invite each of you to think about, and I think all of you are explorers, to think about the plant or animal or people that you might relate to other kinds of values within society in order to cut through the noise and communicate with them. I've started what I call the Research Ambassador Program, funded by the National Science Foundation, to take other scientists to do this kind of work, um, to take their research, uh, their knowledge, their deep knowledge, moving from the unknown to the known, and share that in an, uh, an inclusive way with other people in society. I'll end by just repeating that explorers do have the joy of investigating biota in place that lie outside the ordinary. 
and that we must share what we learn with those who do not share our values. Although there's really very little training, at least in academia for this, I believe that we all can do this. I believe that if a single tree can move around our planet seven times in a year, if Barbie can climb trees with her high-heeled feet, <laughs> if rap singers can inspire urban children, if pulpits can become places to preach about conservation, and if prisoner, prisoners can nurture species and bring them away from extin extinction while even these prisoners are still caged, then I think that explorers like us can counter the deep-rooted and heavily trunked problems of plants and animals and people on our planet. I've learned many lessons with the support of the National Geographic Society. I've learned that by making creative leaps that turn out to be just small stepping stones, by engaging, by engaging partners in all walks of life, and most of all, by opening ourselves to the values of others, we can harness the beautiful movement of seemingly intractable intractable obstacles that will, pro that will propel us upward and onward. Thank you.